Well, what I wanted to talk with you about during the first half hour was the matter of crime. We have uh, come across this subject from time to time on the show, and I, of course, maintain always that liberty is the answer to our problems, that what we need to solve a social problem is more liberty and less government, not less liberty and more government. But there are certain subjects that it is natural for people to feel require more government. If we have a crime wave in this country, and I would certainly call what we have a crime wave, then wouldn't it seem natural that what you need are more police, you need tougher judges, you need bigger prisons, you need more law enforcement in general in order to put down this crime wave? Well, my answer to that is no. What we need is greater liberty. And what I want to demonstrate is that there are several areas in which more government is contributing to this crime wave, and that by getting government out of what it is doing, we can reduce crime in this country. First of all, let's establish how bad this crime wave is, and I can't think of any better example to highlight the problem than to point out that in 1943, there were 44 homicides registered on the books in New York City. 44 homicides in the year 1943. In 1995, New York City had roughly the same population. The population of New York City didn't grow over those 50 years. It remained roughly the same, probably about 6 million people. But in 1995, the city had 1,499 homicides compared with just 44 in 1943. That's about 30 times, actually more than that, but I can't calculate that fast in my head. The interesting thing about the fact that there were 1,499 homicides in New York City in 1995 is that it was celebrated as an improvement, that they were congratulating Mayor Rudy Giuliani on the wonderful job he had done in bringing crime under control in New York City now that there were only 1,499 homicides. And nobody bothered to mention that, gee, this is over 30 times what it was in 1943. All right. What are the ways by which more government has caused crime to increase in the United States? I think there are five of them. And let's take each of them in turn. Number one, gun control. There was a time in America when criminals had to fear law-abiding citizens. If a criminal thought about attacking someone on the street, he had no way of knowing whether his victim was armed because there were no gun control laws whatsoever. If a criminal wanted to rob someone's home, he had to wonder whether the homeowner would meet him with a gun because there were no gun control laws whatsoever. But unfortunately, the ability of innocent people to defend themselves and repel attacks has been vanishing steadily, thanks to gun control. These, what do we call them, criminal-friendly laws, I think would be the best way to put it. These criminal-friendly laws include federal, state, and local requirements that you wait several days before touching a gun that you purchased with good money. Oh, what else? Age restrictions on gun purchases, prohibitions on mail order sales, gun registration or licensing, and mandatory gun locks. As a result of these restrictions, gun ownership hasn't increased since the 1960s and the 1970s, even though violent crime did increase and the population has increased many times over. Well, not many times over, but quite a bit. Consequently, I would have to say that innocent citizens have become more and more at a disadvantage to criminals, and let's turn that statement around and say that criminals now have a greater and greater advantage over innocent citizens, and so they are able to do more freely without fear. We know that government is not efficient, that government doesn't work, and so we have to realize that no matter how many police you have on the street, you are not going to be able to quell crime, because the police are not there to interfere with crime or to prevent crime, but rather to catch criminals after they have committed their deeds and hope that by sending enough of them up the river you will deter others from committing crimes. But policemen themselves do not prevent crime, no matter how many you have. There's a book that was published a few years back called Call 911 and Die, and it, it recounted story after story after story of citizens who were killed in their own homes or in other places who tried to call 911, and of course 911 does not get someone to your home in time to get a criminal who has invaded your home. The point is that you cannot depend upon the police to prevent crime. But innocent citizens can prevent crime. If they are armed, they can stop criminals from coming into their home. They can stop criminals from carjacking. They can stop criminals from mugging them on the street. They can interfere with all kinds of crimes. They can stop shootings at schools. They can stop shootings at post offices and other places of work. They can stop shootings all over the place where the police cannot stop them. But if you disarm the innocent citizens, 
Who's to stop them? And one of the most absurd laws of all is the one that says there can be no guns within whatever it is, 500 yards or 1,500 yards of a school. So what does that mean? Some kid brings a gun to school, and there's nobody to stop him. This is only one of five areas I want to point out regarding the way that more government means more crime. But I'm going to dwell on it because it's a very misunderstood area. And one of the further areas in which it's misunderstood is with regard to the concealed carry laws. A number of states, uh, to the best of my knowledge, about 31 now, at least it was 31 in the year 2000, have concealed carry laws. That means you can go to the proper office and get a permit. It's usually your local police department. And get a permit to carry a gun concealed under your coat or whatever. You're not allowed to carry an open weapon around, but if you have a concealed carry law, it means that you can have a gun in your possession and take it into most public places. Not a school, of course. Oh, I meant to tell you, I'm really getting ahead of myself. There was a case in Mississippi a few years back that was very similar to the Columbine case, the Columbine being the famous one where two boys went in and shot up the school and killed a number of other students. And in this case in Mississippi, which I don't have right at my fingertips, but I could dig up, what happened was a kid went in with a gun and started shooting, but a vice principal ran to his car where he had a gun and took it out of his glove compartment, came back in, and managed to disarm the shooter because of uh, having a gun and threatening to kill the boy. And the result was that the killing stopped with about one or two, whereas many more than that were killed at Columbine. It was just an example of what happens when the victim is armed. The victim is no longer a victim. But getting back to the concealed carry laws, Various studies have been done which have found that the concealed carry laws have significantly reduced violent crime, and there has been no increase in accidental gun deaths, which is, of course, the bugaboo that gun control advocates always raise. Oh, my goodness, you're going to have traffic accidents, and somebody's going to whip out a gun and kill the other person, uh, road rage, you know, all of these things. And yet there have been no reported incidents of this kind of thing, and there have been no statistics showing an increase in accidental gun deaths or violent intentional gun deaths in the heat of arguments and so forth. But I don't want to go too far with this concealed carry business because uh, we shouldn't have to ask the government for a permit to carry a gun. The Second Amendment doesn't have anything in it about the right to keep and bear arms not being infringed, except for the fact that, of course, you have to apply to the local police department to get a permit if you want to be able to carry a gun. What we should have are no gun control laws whatsoever. And I was talking before about the fact that citizens armed means that they can prevent crime, whereas the police is incapable of preventing crime. And a 1994 Department of Justice study estimated that guns interrupt or actually avert about one and a half million crimes each year. Now, of course, whenever there's an incident in which a child is killed accidentally by a gun in somebody's house or whatever it is, that's big news, and that's held up as a reason for gun control. But nobody ever talks about the one and a half million crimes a year that are prevented by private ownership of guns. And they translate not into just one child's life, but thousands of lives that guns save every year. Now let me give you an example. A fellow named Doug Stanton received a phone call that told him that a man who had once stalked his wife was back in town and was on his way to the Stanton house. Doug got home before the stalker got there, but the stalker arrived in the driveway holding a pistol and wearing a bulletproof vest. He shot at the back door, kicked it open, and sprayed bullets into the kitchen. Stanton, however, had a gun, and he fired two shots at the attacker. Even though the attacker had his bulletproof vest on, he staggered and then fled the scene because he didn't want to get shot again. And the police did manage to pick him up shortly afterward because Stanton called and told the police what direction he was going in. And Doug Stanton himself said afterward, quote, because the Stanton family had a gun, six lives were saved. Had there been restrictions on gun ownership, the Stantons would be dead. This is a fact not a hypothetical situation, end of quote. And, of course, I can't ever help wondering how many children at Columbine High School would have been saved if one of the teachers had a gun close by. And when a lunatic starts shooting up a restaurant, how many lives could be saved if just one customer were carrying a gun? Gun control laws make the world safer for criminals and less safe for you. And uh, let me dwell on this just a little longer before I go on to the other four ways in which government increases crime. Politicians say they favor gun control, but they favor it for you, not for themselves. If you visit the Capitol building in Washington, notice how many guards are carrying guns. The politicians want you to be disarmed to make America safer, but they don't disarm government employees. And it isn't just the security guards. Members of various federal agencies are very well armed. 
employees of the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Army Corps of Engineers, the IRS, and many other agencies now carry guns. Obviously, if guns cause crime, why do so many government employees have them? Maybe they have a compelling reason to carry guns. But is it more compelling than your need to defend your home and your family against criminals? One last area to touch on this, and we'll get interrupted on this because we're about to take a break, but let me introduce the subject, and that is, maybe it is reasonable to say that individuals should have the rights to own handguns with appropriate restrictions like gun locks restrictions and such, but who needs such things as assault weapons or mortars? You can't tell me that people ought to be allowed to own those things. Well, as a matter of fact, yes, I can tell you that people ought to be able to allow, ought to be allowed to own assault weapons, mortars, and yes, if my next door neighbor wants to have a tank in his backyard, he can have that too. Who needs such things as assault weapons or mortars or whatever, automatic pistols? Well, maybe you don't, but there are people who do. For instance, during most riots, the police have been outnumbered and they intentionally stay clear of gangs that are looting and vandalizing. Now, just think for a minute. Suppose your life savings are invested in a store that gangs are about to loot. And suppose you have little or no insurance on the store because your store is in a dangerous section of town providing a public service by making available goods and services that no one else will do in that dangerous part of town. Which is exactly what happened with Korean store owners during the Los Angeles riots back uh, when they had the Rodney King verdict. So, put yourself in their place. How are you going to defend the store against the looters? With a knife? With a handgun against maybe a dozen attackers who are themselves armed because somehow or other guns always materialize in the middle of such riots? Or do you need an assault weapon? If you prevent innocent citizens from acquiring assault weapons, you are not preventing criminal gangs from acquiring them because they will find a way to get them even if they have to smuggle them into America from thousands of miles away. So why pass laws that disarm only the innocent and not the guilty? Now, I'm sure that you can imagine the perfect law that's going to allow just the right people to own just the right types of guns and at the same time prohibit other citizens from owning inappropriate firearms. But remember, you're only imagining such a law. It is never going to be a reality because you don't have the political power to get it passed. And even if you could get some politician to introduce it, once the issue is turned over to the politicians, it's going to be decided by whoever has the most political influence. And I can assure you that's never going to be you or I. And in fact, once it becomes a political football, it will be amended in all sorts of different ways. The only valid policy is to have no laws whatsoever regulating the ownership of guns, but to hold every citizen responsible for whatever harm he initiates against others with or without a gun. As always, you should never be prosecuted for what you own, for what you smoke, for what you drink, for what you put in your body, for what you believe, for what you think, for what you say, or for anything that does not involve violence against somebody else. But you should always be prosecuted for committing violence against others, whether or not you do it with a gun, whether or not you're intoxicated at the time, whether or not you're on drugs, whether or not you do it with hate in your heart or liquor on your breath. You should be prosecuted for the violence you do against others, but never for what you own or what you think or what you say or what you put in your body. Now, one last point about gun control. The beauty of free gun ownership, meaning no restrictions whatsoever, is this. You don't have to own a gun if you don't want one. You will still be safer with no gun laws whatsoever, even if you don't own a gun. Just think about it for a minute. You don't want to own a gun, but... Somebody in your neighborhood probably does. I don't know that somebody will or somebody won't. But imagine a criminal entering your neighborhood. He knows there are no gun control laws whatsoever. He knows that any house in that neighborhood may contain people who own guns. And so what's he going to do? Is he likely to just barge into any old house in that neighborhood, not knowing who owns a gun and who doesn't own a gun? In other words, the very possibility that you might own a gun is a form of protection, even if you don't really own a gun. The evidence for this, incidentally, even though it's obviously true, but some hard evidence came in England when after total gun control was installed and people were told to turn in all the guns that they owned, the incidents of what are called hot burglaries increased many times over. And a hot intrusion, I won't just set up a word that I can't pronounce, burglary, the hot intrusions, meaning those where there might be lights on in the house and where there were people home, as opposed to a cold intrusion, where it appeared that no one was home, the incidence of hot intrusions went up several times over because 
robbers, thieves, intruders of one kind or another were no longer afraid of people being home who might have guns available to them. They didn't care anymore. The worst thing that could happen is that they might run into a guy bigger than them who might throw them out of the house or tie them up and call the police or whatever, but they stood no chance whatsoever of getting shot. And so they are much more brazen in intruding in people's homes than they were before all the guns were confiscated. So, once again, I make the point that you don't have to own a gun yourself in order to be safer as a result of repealing all the gun laws entirely. And before I go on to the others, which will not take nearly as much time as this first one did, he said suggestively, let me make one other point, and that is perhaps one of the most ridiculous things in the world is the statement that is made so often by Republican politicians and NRA officials who say we don't need new gun control laws, we should have better enforcement of the 20,000 laws already on the books. And then when somebody's proposing a new gun control law, they cite the Constitution of the Second Amendment. Well, if those things have any force and effect whatsoever, if they have any validity whatsoever, the Second Amendment that is, then why are these people saying there should be better enforcement of the 20,000 laws on the books already? There should be zero laws on the books, and anyone who really believes in the Second Amendment would never say that we should enforce the laws in the books already. And when some politician seems more attractive because he says he wants no new gun control laws but just enforcement of the ones on the books already, he is no more attractive than his opponent because he will cave in when a new law is presented, especially if his party tells him to cave in. All right, we covered the first of the five ways that are obvious in more government causing more crime. Second one is having the federal government in law enforcement. First of all, understand that the Constitution gives no authority whatsoever to the federal government to uh, prosecute uh, common crimes in any way. There's no authority in the Constitution for there to be federal laws against murder, rape, kidnapping, anything of the sort. There are only three crimes mentioned in the Constitution, and they are treason, piracy, and counterfeiting. Hmm, three things the federal government itself does, but that's beside the point. The point is that the federal government has no authority whatsoever to be involved in crime. And there's no reason for it to be. All crime is local. It occurs in the jurisdiction of a police department or a sheriff's department somewhere in the country. And so there was no need to provide any authority for the federal government to be involved with common crimes. But, of course, the politicians never lose sleep over constitutional limitations. And so they have passed federal laws against carjacking, vandalism, hate crimes, kidnapping, discrimination, fraud, pornography, uh, gun ownership, drugs, practically anything that any politician just personally doesn't happen to like. Now, it's important to realize that we gain nothing from having a federal police force of any kind. Local law enforcement agencies help each other capture fugitives. They share fingerprints. They extradite criminals from one state to another. They cooperate across state lines all the time. They don't need a federal police force to help protect you. If they wanted a national database, if they thought that would help them uh, prosecute crimes, then they would form a national database. It doesn't have to be done by the federal government. Any state that wanted to could be involved with a national database. In fact, there could be several national databases so that if one of them proved to be defective, they could all patronize another one, or most of them patronize another one, or patronize whatever one each one of them thought was the most effective. But the important thing is that a federal police force makes you less safe because the federal government's involvement in law enforcement gives politicians another excuse to spend more of your money, and it gives federal bureaucrats the power to dictate politically correct policies to your local police department. And it does more damage, of course, to your constitutional liberties. Uh, liberties excuse me. But the Founding Fathers, of course, would be shocked to see uh, police forces such as the FBI, uh, the BATF, and the DEA, and so forth, because they explicitly warned, warned against the idea of having the federal government deal with common crimes. And they knew that a federal police force would probably lead to events like the FBI, BATF massacre of the Branch Davidians at Waco, and the shooting of an innocent woman and her child at Ruby Ridge, which we don't need to get into now. But one of the important things is the way opening the door to federal law enforcement opens the door to all kinds of iniquities, because every federal law includes intrusive and expensive provisions that you never hear about. And, of course, crime bills are no exception. After the Columbine High School massacre, the House of Representatives passed the Juvenile Crime Bill. Doesn't that sound good? Juvenile Crime Bill. Ah, they're finally going to do something about juvenile crime. They're going to reduce teenage violence. Naturally, conservatives supported the bill because they'll support any bill that gives the government more power to do anything about crime. And, of course, they didn't want to be insensitive in the midst of a supposed crisis of any kind. Liberals supported the bill because they didn't notice that it gave the government more power to use warrantless wiretaps, 
Oh, let's see. It allowed police to intercept messages going to your pager. Isn't that nice? Well, of course, now it would probably allow them to intercept messages going to your cell phone. It promoted drug testing of all school children. And it gave increased immunity to police who might commit violent crimes against you. Now, that's a way to reduce teenage crime. There must be a lot of teenagers on police forces. And, of course, <laughs> as usual, the politicians had no idea what they were voting on because they never read the bills. Here's another example. Bill Clinton made a huge show of a proposal to put 100,000 new local patrolmen on the streets, paid for by the federal government. He introduced that at the State of the Union message, and people went wild. Oh, isn't this great? I shouldn't say people went wild. Politicians went wild, and they're not people. I mentioned Bill Clinton uh, proudly announcing his proposal to have the federal government pay for 100,000 new local policemen to patrol the streets, people who would be out there preventing crime, deterring crime, warding off criminals, and so forth. They passed the bill in 1994, both houses of Congress, and it appropriated $8.8 .8 billion of your money for new policemen. But, you know, this is really going to surprise you. There was a whole lot of non-crime goodies for anyone with a political clout to get on the gravy train. Had all kinds of subsidies for this and subsidies for that, having nothing to do with crime whatsoever. Five years later, in 1999, the Inspector General's office audited the program and found that all the subsidies in that bill had been duly paid but where were the cops? Only about 40,000 had been added to the nation's police forces five years after the bill was passed. And, of course, the bill did include new controls on any local police department that used the bill to take some of the subsidies. And the point is that every time the federal government passes a new law about crime, it contains all sorts of ways that police resources are diverted to politically correct functions and are less available to reduce crime. Moving on, number three, asset forfeiture laws. And since we're running out of time here, and I don't want to devote the whole broadcast to this, let me jump ahead. You know what asset forfeiture laws are. If you don't, we'll go into them some later time. The important thing about them is that they, first of all, of course, are creating real havoc for innocent people who have their property seized by local or federal uh, law enforcement agencies, and then those people have to sue to get their property back, even though they have never been convicted of a crime, never even charged with a crime. But the most important thing with regard to the crime rate is that because local and federal police agencies use asset forfeiture to seize assets, sell them at auction, and pay for part of their budgets and allow them to use these for budgetary purposes, what happens is that many law enforcement officials pay more attention to cases involving property that can be seized, more attention to that, and less to cases in which your life or property may be threatened. The result being that asset forfeiture diverts law enforcement attention from the job of reducing crime and sends it over into the area of seizing property. All right, the fourth is obvious. The prosecution of victimless crimes like drug offenses, prostitution, gambling, and so forth is an obvious way by which more government means more crime because all of this diverts resources away from the prosecution of violent crime. And understand that if a pimp or a drug dealer or a numbers uh, dealer commits violence against somebody else, that's violence, and that's a crime. But when somebody sells a prostitute's services to someone else on a consensual basis, that is not violence. When somebody sells some drugs to another person or somebody takes the drugs, that's not violence. And when somebody gets together a poker game in the, or a dice game in the back alley, that's not violence. But by diverting resources to the vice squad, every law enforcement agency that does so is reducing the resources available to try to stop real crime. And the drug laws, of course, are the worst offender in this regard. They fill up the prisons with nonviolent people so that violent people get off early on plea bargains or early release, and the result is that they're back in the streets to commit more violent crimes. One of the worst areas of this is the mandatory minimums, and they do not in of themselves create more crime, but they create such tremendous injustice that I can't help but mention it, and they also help to fill up the prisons. Back in 1986, there was a basketball star named Len Bias who was a big college All-American, and he was drafted by the Boston Celtics of the National Basketball Association. Only before he could ever show up at the Boston Celtics, he died of a cocaine overdose. Incidentally, an overdose usually means not that somebody took more than they should, but rather they took something stronger than they thought they did, which is one of the bad effects of the drug war. When drugs were sold in drugstores by companies like Bayer and so on, people knew what they were buying. They knew how potent what they were buying was. They took things in measured doses, and they didn't have 
overdoses as we think of overdoses today. But anyway, when he died of this alleged overdose, House Speaker Tip O'Neill, he was the Speaker of the House, and he was from, guess where, Boston. He saw this as an opportunity to show that Democrats are just as tough on drugs as Republicans, and so he exploited by his death in the way of rushing a bill through Congress before the 1986 elections. And the bill fixed minimum sentences for a whole range of crimes, but mostly drug crimes. In other words, it said, no more of this being soft on drug dealers and other people. From now on, the federal government says you have to sentence somebody to at least X number of years for this particular crime, whatever it happens to be. Now, of course, Republicans eagerly embraced the bill because that was in keeping with their long-standing complaints that judges are soft on crime and letting people off with light sentences, especially in regard to drug crimes. Now, needless to say, no congressman took the time to read any part of the bill. There were no hearings. There was virtually no discussion of the bill before it was passed. And this legislation has now been shown to cause gross injustice in the sentences imposed upon nonviolent criminals and even on innocent bystanders. And, of course, it has overflowed the nation's prisons, and it has destroyed thousands of lives. And, of course, laws are rarely ever repealed, not even bad ones. So, instead, whatever problem seems to develop from a law is always fixed by passing another law. And that usually makes matters worse. And this was the case with the 1986 bill. When, it found, when they found out that this wasn't really putting away any big-time drug dealers, big surprise, they decided that they needed another law. So they passed another one that held everyone in a drug organization responsible for every crime committed by anyone in that drug organization. And, of course, the police get to define what an organization is. But what this means is that if you've got a drug dealer, a big kingpin with a whole bunch of people working for him, the errand boy who never carries anything more important than sandwiches and coffee could receive the same sentence as Mr. Big. Now, I know you're not going to be surprised when I inform you that this law didn't catch any big fish either. In fact, it did just the opposite. Now, when a major drug dealer was caught, he could provide what is called, quote, substantial assistance, unquote, by ratting on anybody underneath him. And that is the provision in the law that allows him to get a lighter sentence. In other words, gee, if we let somebody who assists the police to get a lighter sentence, they'll turn in at everybody else and we'll get Mr. Big. But because of this 1998 law that fixed the 1986 law, the result has been groups of smaller fish went to prison with long sentences that had been intended for the Big Barracuda. Why? Because whenever Mr. Big was caught, he turned in all the people underneath him, and Mr. Big got to go free and start another drug organization. And, of course, the result has been that since Mr. Big can turn in 10 people, while each of those 10 people can only turn in Mr. Big, the prison uh, population has exploded. In fact, as far back as February 2000, the prison population apparently reached 2 million people, according to the Justice Policy Institute. But this explosion in the prison population hasn't taken violent criminals off the street. For the most part, it's only scooped up these low-level drug offenders. And in many cases, innocent people who were fingered by high-level drug dealers who were providing, quote, substantial assistance, unquote. Now, an example of how these laws put innocent people in while letting people who are more significantly involved in the drug trade out is the case of Clarence Aaron. In 1992, he was a 23-year-old college student in Alabama. He'd never been in law, uh, trouble with the law when he agreed to drive some of his friends to a drug transaction in Baton Rouge. In other words, his friends wanted to score some drugs, and he said, all right, I'll drive you down there because he had a car, and they didn't. Well, they got caught. And, of course, under the mandatory minimum laws, if you provide substantial assistance, you can be exempted from the mandatory minimums and get a much lower sentence or maybe no sentence at all. Whereas if you do not provide that substantial assistance, you must be sentenced to a minimum of X number of years, depending on the nature of the crime. So when they were caught, his friends, guess what, provided substantial assistance and testified in court against Clarence Aaron. He had never dealt drugs himself. He had never even touched drugs. And so it didn't matter. He was convicted anyway. The jury thought, well, this guy was convicted. People testified as the first-hand experience that he was involved in a drug deal. We have no choice but to convict him. It's his first offense. He'll probably get off with six months in jail or something else, maybe even parole for a year or whatever it is. The jury had no idea that Clarence Aaron, who had never been involved in a drug deal directly, had never used drugs, would be sentenced to three life sentences without any possibility of parole whatsoever. In other words, Clarence Aaron has been put in a black hole and will never be heard from again. His life is over. He was 23 years old when all of this happened, and his life is gone. Now, Jesse Jackson would say, if you can't do the time, 
don't do the crime. So what was Clarence's crime that warranted three life sentences without possibility of parole? Did he beat up somebody? Did he rape a woman? Did he kill someone? No. He drew, drove some friends to a drug deal, and those friends would never have testified against him and made him the scapegoat if it weren't for the mandatory minimum laws. I'm going to put the case of Clarence Aaron up on my website on the radio links page. Just go to harrybrown.org, and right at the top of my homepage, you'll see a reference to the links page. Just go to the links page, and that will be there after the next break. All right, the fifth and final reason that more government means more crime is that it breaks down all of the ideas of law and order that we have because the government will pass laws on anything people begin not to respect law itself they think well if it's all right to break the law by smoking marijuana when that's against the law and i know it doesn't hurt anybody well maybe it won't hurt anybody to to defraud an insurance company or something else but there's an even more important way this happens and that is that it allows law enforcement people to harm innocents and divert resources from the criminals. Every time they pass one of these new laws, like an asset forfeiture law, for instance, professional criminals who are in the business, the very business that these laws are aimed at, will understand the laws. It's their business, too. Just as you would understand any new laws that affected your business, if you have a store or a service or whatever, and a new law comes out, some newsletter is going to tell you about it and make sure that you know about it. And if there there were no such sources, you'd go out and find out yourself because it's your business. Well, criminals are in business also. And when a new asset forfeiture law comes out that says that they can seize somebody's bank account, what does a professional criminal do? He makes sure that he doesn't have any money in a bank account. He buries it in the backyard or does whatever is necessary to make sure that the new law will not affect him. And so... What I'm saying is that professional criminals make it their business to limit the risk of prosecution, to limit the risk of liability that might occur as a result of these laws that are passed. But the innocent know very, very little about the 1,001 new laws that are passed each year. And so they're shocked, they're helpless when a government agency moves in on them. This is why tough new laws aimed at crime always seem to hurt the innocent more than the guilty. And the point is, too, that the law enforcement officers and agencies realize that they're not going to get the criminals with these laws, but they can get the innocent because the innocent are oblivious to them. They can seize assets from an innocent's bank account, even though they can't from a guilty person's. And so what do they do? Well, some of them will do nothing as a result of it, but some of them will go after innocent people, seize their resources, prosecute them even possibly, in order to pad their conviction record. And the result of all of this is that by passing these laws, the government has made it less safe for innocent people and more safe for guilty people because the law enforcement resources are diverted. So here we have five things. And getting rid of any one of the five or all of the five would make us safer. Number one, repeal the gun control laws and criminals will start fearing innocent citizens. Number two, get the federal government out of local law enforcement, and local law enforcement will be much more effective and less expensive. Number three, repeal the asset forfeiture laws so that crime-fighting agencies will refocus on the most dangerous uh, criminals rather than those with the most valuable property, end the prosecution of victimless crimes, and reduce the enormous number of pointless and harmful laws and regulations. Let's go to Boston, or pardon me, to Massachusetts. Same thing? No, not at all. And I find that she just hung up. So... You just shouldn't give up after the first hour. I just don't know what to say. Well, I got an email, and that um, I've lost the name, but it was a link to a an item at the lewrockwell.com blog, and it uh, has to do with our discussion tonight uh, on gun control and so on. It's a little short piece by Anthony Gregory, who's a young man in his early 20s, a college, I believe he's a college student, and he writes for lewrockwell.com and very intelligent articles. And he says, I had argued with my anti-gun liberal friend about gun control in the past. She finally asked me today, why should someone be allowed to have a machine gun? Why not, I asked. Well, that didn't work. So she asked again, and I said, do you think the Bush administration should have a monopoly on guns to do here what it has already done in Baghdad? Isn't that scary? You know, every genocide in the 20th uh, 20th century history began with gun control. One of the few differences between us and 1930s Germany is that we still have some of our gun rights left. As long as we do, we have some hope against fascism. And you know what she said? She said, you know, you're right. I never thought of that. It's so obvious, though. Why doesn't anyone realize that? It's so obvious. If you have all the guns, you're a dictator. This wasn't the first time that invoking the frightening Bush administration has helped me make a liberal friend rethink his or her entire opinion on the gun issue. Well, that's a good point. Uh, Not just the point about 
anyone who has all the guns is obviously a dictator, but the idea that you must always attach a bad government policy to someone that you know the listener does not care for. In other words, if you're talking to a liberal, say, do you want George Bush to have this kind of power, whatever it may be, in this case, the power to uh, deprive people of having guns, and then the Bush administration has a monopoly on guns. But if you're talking to a Republican who somehow favors gun control, well, do you think that somebody like Bill Clinton ought to have all of the guns in the country at his disposal and we don't have any? And that helps considerably, especially when the person is not in power that you're going to use as an example. Because people look at the person who is in power and say, well, he's a nice person, he won't abuse this. But that person's going to leave office one day, and when he does, wow. All right, Brian sends a note saying, Brian's in Tampa, Florida, I've heard speakers say that if Asian banks decide to cash in U.S. Treasury bonds and invest in a stronger euro, or just to convert to money in their own economies, that it could devastate the U.S. economy. In your opinion, is such a thing possible? Alan Greenspan has said it's not a threat. Well, he has another question, but I'll stop right there. The fact is that foreign governments and individuals do not own that much of the U.S. debt. I could get the figure for you, and I will try to do so at the next break. But it is it, at one time it was something like 15% the last time I checked, which was a few years ago. And if it's gotten really bad since then, it might be up to 18 or 20%, but I doubt that it has. And the point being that these people are not a monolithic organization. There are some governments, there are some corporations, there's a lot of individuals, and they're not all going to decide at one time to cash in their U.S. Treasury bonds. So this does not represent a threat. But I have heard this story over and over and over again for the last 20 years. Oh, one day soon, those governments are no longer going to put up with deficit spending in the United States, and they're going to, going to pull the rug out from out under the United States government. Well, you know what I think of the United States government. You know what I think of the United States government's debt but that doesn't make this theory right. It isn't right. Also, what is your take on Alan Greenspan? I know your take on the Federal Reserve System as a whole, but is he a good guy doing the best he can in a bad system? He does, or at least did, defend the, that the currency should be on the gold standard. But he hasn't done anything to try to get the currency on the gold standard, Brian, unfortunately. And I don't think that you can have a good man in a bad situation. He is trying to manipulate the money supply, just like Paul Volcker before him, and just like all the other Fed chairmen before them. You no more want somebody in the federal government deciding what current interest rates should be than you do having them decide what the price of a grapefruit should be. It is price control any way you look at it, and it is just as stupid and just as harmful when it applies to the money supply and interest rates as it is when it applies to any other commodity. Brian goes on, on the same note, while I was searching on the Internet for articles relating to this, I came across some articles from 1999 and 2000 about the federal government buying back treasury bonds. I didn't mention that they were buying them back with money borrowed from our retirement fund. Showing that the national debt at over $6.6 trillion and going down, and projecting that we would be at about $2 trillion in 2004 and debt-free by 2012, and now we're at almost $7.4 billion. Oh, Brian, I don't know who gave you this information, but it's crazy. The federal debt has gone up month by month, year by year, every single year since 1969. And despite all those great surpluses we supposedly had from the Clinton administration and the Republican Congress in the late 1990s, we have not had a real surplus since 1969. They just papered over the, the deficit by borrowing the money from the Social Security system. Only it isn't really borrowing it, it's plundering it. And the idea of a lockbox is about the most laughable thing you can imagine. All right, as long promised, now let's go to the phones. Kayleen in Massachusetts, good evening. Good evening, my esteemed Mr. Brown. Sorry to keep you waiting so long, and I don't blame you for hanging up on me. <laughs> of course, people hang up on me all the time. Deb, I, I rarely do, but this is one of your best broadcasts ever. I love it, I love it, I love it. Well, that's um, good. One thing that I wanted to mention um, is um, I'm sure you've heard of a book titled Guns Save Lives by Robert A. Waters. I don't know offhand that I've heard of that one in particular. Is it the kind of book that's available on Amazon? Yes, it's, a, it's actually just, it's a a combination of true stories where guns saved um, possible victims of violent crimes. Oh, well, that's a good book to yeah, have absolutely. on the market because that's the, the greatly overlooked part of this whole debate is that nobody ever mentions when they're debating gun control laws. Absolutely. All the crimes that are averted, all the lives that are saved by people having guns in mm -hmm. their possession. And so, at the, at the uh, end, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry uh, gun, be, let's at, get it again. Guns save lives. Guns save lives. And uh, it's written by Robert A. Waters. Okay, I will look that up, and when I put the other item on the Radio Links page uh, within the next 20 minutes, I'll also put a link to its page on Amazon so people can check there and read what uh, is said about the book. 
And um, I just uh, wanted to say that um, yeah, at the beginning of your broadcast, you were talking about gun laws, the 20-plus thousand unconstitutional gun laws. And uh, we were actually thinking, my husband and I, of suing the state of Massachusetts for being unconstitutional with their gun uh, control laws. Suing them, did you say? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's an idea. Uh, maybe it might even get some publicity and call attention to what's going on. Uh, also, I wanted to mention in uh, gun control laws that uh, my father-in-law um, lives in New Orleans. And uh, up until a couple of years ago, it was illegal in New Orleans to carry a handgun in your car. And the rate of violent crime up until then was extremely high. And uh, when that was, um, when the law was changed to where you could carry a handgun in your car, the rate of violent crime and especially carjacking in particular, uh, carjacking, uh, went down to almost zero in New Orleans. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm glad to hear that. All right, thanks so much for your call, Kayleen, and have a good week. All right, you too. Thank you. You bet. James in Oregon, what's uh, happening tonight way out there on the Pacific Coast? Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you. I, I, I agree completely with everything you've said for the first uh, hour and 15 minutes of your show, I think it was. Something like that. Yeah, well, <laughs> the first eternity, we call it. <laughs> it's your show, like you say, right? Um, and, yeah, you were right on the money um, in pretty much everything you said. But as you were speaking, it occurred to me, and this is going to strike you as uh, more than a little ironic, that the solution to all five of the things you listed... No, don't uh, no, don't get upset here. Uh, it's to pass two new laws. Now, I got to tell you what they are. <laughs> yes, of course. And, and if you give them to your local congressman to introduce them, I'm sure nobody will change them. But go ahead. Well, this is I'm, I'm dealing theoretically here. Um, law number one: make it illegal, punishable by incarceration or death, to pass any law that criminalizes any benign human behavior. Where benign human behavior is defined as any human behavior that does not violate the individual rights of any other person or persons, and it does not, or and or does not diminish the country's ability to protect us from foreign attack. Right. I, I would uh, make a suggestion there. Instead of referring to not violating rights, violating rights, because then you get into a, a separate argument over what are rights and so forth and so on, I would say anything that does not involve violence against another person. Well, then what about fraud? Well, we'll have to have a discussion on that. That's a, a long subject, but we should have a discussion on that one night on the show because it's just going to shock some people, but I don't believe fraud should be a crime. Yeah, but if I sell you uh, a drug and say it's good for you and it kills you, I mean... Well, I, I shouldn't buy a drug unless somebody can prove to me that the drug is safe. Uh, long it, discussion. Yeah. I realize that that seems to open a whole can of worms, but in the long run, I think we are safer by not having laws against fraud than we are by having laws against fraud. And that's no surprise since all the other laws seem to work out so badly, but I can well understand people not agreeing with me on this, so we should have a discussion on it some night, and maybe I'll prepare a, an initial diatribe to inflict upon you folks at the beginning of a forthcoming show. Okay. James, that's great. Thanks so much for calling, and uh, stay in touch. All right, let's talk quickly <coughs> with Ed in Maine. Good evening, Ed. What's on your mind tonight? Hey, Harry. Yes. Uh, I did some door to door for the Democrats today, and I found out that Democrats don't necessarily think the way the leadership tells them to, to think. Yeah, in what respect? On what kind of issue? Uh, tax cap, for example. Tax and cuts? Cap. Oh, tax cap. Yeah, we have a 1% property tax cap initiative uh, on the ballot in November. Oh, yes. You mean some Democrats own property? Yeah. I thought they were all poor welfare queens. <laughs> uh, oh, I, I'm sorry. I'm listening to Russia <laughs> and they And they do resent it. And, they, and they're not necessarily supporting uh, the ticket. Uh, and some of them aren't going to vote. <laughs> well, that's good. That's interesting. And I, I think that's a very important point you're making. We tend to think that there are all sorts of people who would never support repealing the income tax, or yeah. in your case, putting a cap on property taxes, or in Massachusetts, repealing the Massachusetts income tax when, in fact, it was either 46 or 47 percent of those who went to the polls in 2002 voted for an initiative in Massachusetts to repeal the state income tax. So we should never count people out, whatever their party affiliation, whatever their age, whatever their race, whatever their gender, whatever. We must realize that in the final analysis, virtually everybody on the planet wants greater control over his own life, more of his own money to spend, and so on. And and he may not want it for other people, but he definitely wants it for himself. And, Ed, I'm sorry to cut you short, but I am uh, glad you called in with that bit of information. Yeah. And uh, if you've got anything more to say about it, let me know next week because I'd like to hear it. As for you out there, do something nice for yourself and your family this week, and don't let the government get you down. This is Harry Brown. Don't forget to tune in again next week. Good night. <laughs>